It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Speaker, my first question is to the Premier. Last week, Cabinet appointed a close friend of the Premier's to the role of Commissioner of the Ontario Provincial Police after the job criteria were changed in a way that allowed him to apply. The Premier led the Cabinet decision that resulted in the appointment of his friend. Why didn't the Premier recuse himself? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, Superintendent Ron Tavner is one of the most decorated police officers yep. in the country, the longest serving police yep. officer in the country. Yep. Accolades from across the country came in supporting Superintendent Ron Tavner. When we talk to OPP officers, police officers around this province, the morale is low, very low. We need someone in there that connects with the frontline people, that connects with communities, that has a record of going after guns and gangs. Yeah. There was no better choice, a transparent choice, by the way, that I wasn't involved in whatsoever. There were three people, individual people, on, on a panel that made that decision. I didn't know that decision, Mr. Speaker, until the day it was made. Sure. But I appreciate the Leader of the Opposition trying to go after a great police officer, Response. a person that has That's served this country for 50 years. That's what they do. The Start the clock. Supplementary. <laughs> On the contrary, Speaker, it's the Premier I'm going after. <laughs> Look, the Premier has stated that he had no role at all in uh, Taverner's appointment, even though he led the Cabinet discussion that resulted in his appointment. So my question then is, when did the Premier learn that Ron Taverner was submitting his name? Oh. Premier? Through you, Mr. Speaker, we understand that the opposition Every time it's about the police, they don't like the police. It's very simple. They don't like the police. Yep. Let me give you a couple of quotes. Let me give you a couple of quotes from reputable police officers, presidents of police associations. This quote was from Mike McCormick, president of the Toronto Police Association. I can't think of a more qualified and dedicated leader for the job than Ron Tavner is a huge asset for the people of Ontario. He's been a strong advocate the community, for the community in our city the OPP's gain in Toronto's loss. Here's another one from the OPP uh, Association. This is a person, Rob Jamison, that talks to OPP officers every single day on behalf of all uniform and civilian members of the OPPA. I would like to welcome our new commissioner. We look forward to working collaboratively with Commissioner Ron Tavner, someone who has such a proven track record in law enforcement. Here's another one. Let's Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, with all due respect, this is about the Premier, not about Mr. Tavener. The initial job criteria laid out in the job posting would have made it impossible for Ron Tavener to apply for this position. Did the Premier discuss the job criteria with Mr. Tavener or anyone else before the criteria were rewritten on October 22nd? Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The answer is absolutely not. But let me continue on. This is Bruce Chapman, President of the Police Association of Ontario. I've known Superintendent Ron Tavner for 30 years plus. He's a hardworking, progressive, and dedicated officer. Ron is a great choice to lead the Ontario Provincial Police. Here is Ron uh, about Ron Tavner from the Chief of Police of Toronto. After serving Toronto Police for more than 50 years, there are few people who will leave behind a legacy yeah. so rich in community service as Ron Tavner. I wish him every success as he begins a new chapter with Ontario Provincial Police. The right man. 
Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. The Deputy Minister of Community Safety, Mario Di Tommaso, sat on the Premier's selection committee tasked with finding a new OPP commissioner. He also is a close acquaintance of Ron Taverners and his former supervisor. Did anyone at any point raise concerns with the Premier about this possible conflict of interest? Premier. It's, it's very clear. I, I, I just can't believe we have the Leader of the Opposition trashing a person that has dedicated 50 years of his life, longest-serving police officer, trying to degrade him. This man is a man of integrity. He's a man of honesty. He's, he's going to change the OPP. He's going to make sure the frontline police officers are listened to. He's going to work with the community. He's going to get rid of the guns and gangs in these large cities. You couldn't ask for a better OPP commissioner than Ron Tavern. Here, here. Stop the clock. Members, please take your seats. Start the clock again. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, there the Premier goes again, calling people names. But I do have a job to do, so throughout a process in which a close friend. Government side, come to order. Start the clock. I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition. The process in which a close friend of the Premier was given a job, another close friend sat on the selection committee, and the job description was rewritten in a way that would allow the Premier's friend to apply. Is the Premier saying that no one at any point flagged any concerns about possible conflicts of interest? Premier. Well, I, I take great, great exception. What leader of the NDP are saying, you know, I have thousands of friends, unlike maybe the leader of the NDP. <laughs> I, I, I know thousands of people that support us. Sure. And as for the deputy minister, Mario, I, I don't even know, to be honest, I don't know his last name. So he's not one of my close friends. He's a professional that was hired through the secretary of cabinet. And what a, what a great choice the secretary made. But again, this goes back to reforming the OPP, not going with all the insiders, the brass and everything. This is about making sure, this is about making sure that the OPP have a reputable person at the head of the OPP, someone that can relate to the frontline officers, Spons? someone that will relate to communities across this province. Final supplementary. Yeah. Well, Speaker, I actually believe that the police play a vital role in our province. A vital role. Protecting the public, protecting the side, public and enforcing the law. We put an incredible amount of trust in them. We count on them, Speaker, in every part of our province. When we fill key positions like this one, Speaker, there can't be questions lingering. Does the Premier agree that we need to clear the air and allow the Integrity Commissioner to look into this appointment process and make his report public? Yeah. Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I find it ironic the leader of the NDP is saying they support the police, but she wouldn't ask her own member from Brampton East to step down during the election when he was running around with F the police. Yeah. Who does that? No one in my caucus would ever say that. Yeah, he someone said it, they wouldn't be here. They don't like the police, they don't like our military, they don't like anyone in uniform. That's the problem. I'm going to caution all members on the use of intemperate language, which causes disorder in the House, and I would ask them to keep, their, keep that in mind as they phrase their responses as well as their questions. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, since the Premier wouldn't answer the questions, I'll ask the questions to the Minister of Community Safety. The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services has responsibility to the people of Ontario to ensure that key appointments, like the OPP Commissioner, are conducted fairly and transparently. 
Was the minister aware of the Premier's friend and the Premier's friendship with Ron Taverner when he applied for the job? And if so, what steps did she take to ensure an impartial process? The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. The opposition should be ashamed of taking a five-decade five candidate and suggesting that there was anything inappropriate about him applying and ultimately receiving an endorsement with 100% uh, support and 100% support from me and our cabinet on Thursday when we endorsed that independent hiring. I am embarrassed that you do not believe that Ron Tavner is an appropriate choice. And I will go back to the president of the Ontario Police Association. On behalf of the uniformed and civilian members of the OPPA, I would like to welcome our new commissioner. It is very unfortunate that the NDP don't have the same integrity to thank him for serving. Once again, I'll remind members, intemperate language does not uh, add anything to the debate and only causes disorder in the House. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We'll try one more time. Uh, the minister had a role to play. And there's now Government serious side, questions about whether she took the steps required to ensure a fair, transparent process. Keep going, keep going. The top police. Stop the clock. Government side, come to order. I can't hear the member for Brampton North. Start the clock. I apologize to the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll start again. To the minister. The minister had a role to play, and there's now serious questions about whether she took the steps required to ensure a fair and transparent process. The top policing job in the province has gone to a close personal friend of the Premier. The Premier did not recuse himself. Did the minister at any point, at any point, raise concerns about the Premier's obvious conflict of interest? And if not, why not? Minister. Speaker, allow me to share some of the facts of this story. First, Independent Hiring Commission 100% endorsed Ron Tavner. Then, we moved from there to a cabinet 100% endorsement of Ron Tavner as the OPP yep. Commissioner. And I must remind you that Bruce Chapman, the president of the Police Association, I've known Superintendent Ron Tavner for 30 plus years. He's a hardworking, progressive, and dedicated officer. I do not understand why the NDP refused to endorse what everyone else sees, a quality candidate that is going to serve the province of Ontario well as the OPP Commissioner. I'm proud to endorse Ron Tavern. I'm disappointed that you don't understand the that oh. Once again, I'll remind the House that uh, when the standing ovation erupted, the volume of the standing ovation was such I could not hear the minister complete her answer. I had to stand up and cut her off. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Consumer Services. Yesterday, the Minister, in cooperation with the Minister of Housing and, Univers and Rural Affairs, to make sure that the sales of excess buildings. I know that a great number of members are how come the vacant buildings should be put to a better use of nearly 10 million dollars every year this is a staggering sum and it is all to just maintain properties that are of no use to the people of ontario we are not using these properties and we are not benefiting from the services they could provide this money is being wasted on snow removal grass cutting and structural maintenance 
Mr. Speaker, can the minister inform this House sure. of how he intends to deal with these properties and get this money back into productive use for the people of Ontario? Good. Question. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague from Mississauga Centre for her question. Ontario currently has hundreds of vacant surplus properties across our great province, costing the government and taxpayers millions of dollars a year to maintain. Yesterday, we announced a more efficient process for selling surplus government properties. The improved plan will reduce red tape, create more affordable housing and long-term care spaces, and put more money in people's pockets. We announced a process to accelerate the disp disposition of 243 properties. Properties are currently sitting empty and unused, while taxpayers fund snow removal, grass cutting, and regular maintenance. We streamlined the process that will remove an estimated 150 days of administrative time, generate between 105 and 135 million in revenue after four years, and save the government an estimated 9.6 million dollars in liabilities. Hey, good idea. Simply put, Mr. Speaker, we are taking the sensible approach. Response. We are implementing a more efficient process to put surplus properties into productive use and more money into programs and services for the people of Ontario. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I wish to thank the minister for his answer. I wish to thank him again, as well as the housing minister, for the work they do in this file eh, to make sure that Ontario is on a great fiscal footing. Uh, minister. Minute. properties are costing Ontarians millions of dollars every year while offering no benefit to them or their communities. I would like to know what benefit taxpayers can expect to see from the selling off of these properties. What process will be used to ensure their value is maximized for local communities? And more importantly, Mr. Speaker, how can we ensure these properties are finally sold in a quick, responsible manner rather than being left on the province's books for another 10 or 15 years? Minister. Thank I you, think Mr. Speaker. Be a good answer. My colleague asked a very important question, one that has been at the heart of how we are addressing the issue of surplus properties. We need to ensure that these properties are put to the best use of taxpayer dollars. That is why we are implementing a prudent reforms and removing unnecessary red tape. By removing unnecessary red tape, we can remove an estimated 150 days of administrative time. This will put properties on the market in a shorter time frame, and by putting them into productive use, help local economies and create jobs. I'm also happy to report that our plan will also support Ontario's most vulnerable. We'll be identifying properties within the portfolio that can be repurposed for affordable housing and long-term care spaces. I'll be working with my colleagues, the Minister of Municipal Good Affairs idea. and Housing and Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, to pinpoint surplus properties that can help our most vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, our plan is about working harder, smarter, and more efficiently so we can reduce costs, generate much-needed revenue, and make life better for the people Ontario's of Ontario. Ontario's number one real estate agent. Thank you. The member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, former OPP Commissioner Chris Lewis is a decorated police veteran who served the OPP and our province for 36 years. As the Premier knows, Lewis has questioned the wisdom of the Premier's appointment of the new OPP Commissioner, calling it, quote, a travesty. Yesterday, Speaker, the Premier responded by questioning the integrity of this decorated former Commissioner. Will he take the opportunity to apologize to former Commissioner Lewis today? Members, take your seats. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker. You know, again, I, I find this very I ironic. And the, the, the Commissioner, Chris Lewis, I'll tell you, lost a lot of respect from police officers right across this province yep. with his comments. And he keeps throwing rocks in a glass house. Yep. You know, he has more baggage than he carries than a 747 going across seas. You know something? You don't throw rocks in a glass house. Maybe, matter of fact, maybe the media should look into Chris Lewis's background. That's what they should be doing. Supplementary. It's a wonder uh, the Premier's caucus barely could conjure up a, a round of applause for that answer. It was terrible. One of the worst answers I've ever heard in this place, actually, Speaker. Yeah, you can, you can clap for me. Speaker, we know that the Premier, Order. We know that the Premier has had a lot of first-hand experience Order. and challenges facing law enforcement, but questioning the integrity of a decorated former commissioner who spent over three 
decades serving the OPP and the province of Ontario. It's a new low for this Premier. Will the Premier show a little respect for this Order. dedicated police service person and former commissioner and use this opportunity to do the right thing, show some respect for our forces, stand up and apologize to former Commissioner Lewis? Premier. Through you, through you, Mr. Speaker. It'd be nice to have some policy. Again, again, there was a transparent process with Audgers making a decision, with the deputy deputy minister making a decision, and the secretary of cabinet. And guess what? It was unanimous. And the person from Audgers, a reputable firm, one of the largest in the country, one of the largest in the country said he's never received, in 30 years, has he ever received more accolades about a candidate ever in his career 30 years. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Flamborough, Glanbrook. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Excellent. Yesterday, our Government for the People voted to pass third reading of Bill 34, the Green Energy Repeal Act. The Green Energy Act paved the way for the signing of horrible contracts that lined the pockets of insiders. No family should ever have to choose between heating and eating, here, here. and yet this is exactly the burden the last government put on our families. Yep. I was proud to stand with our government in cancelling the Green Energy Act, one of the worst bills in Ontario's history. Ever. For a decade and a half, we had to suffer the impacts of failed policies by the governments of Dalton McGuinty and the member from Don Valley West. Mr. Speaker, can the minister elaborate on why the Green Energy Act contracts were bad deals that took away the decision-making authority of municipalities? Great question. Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, and Minister of Indigenous Welfare. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Flamborough, Glanbrook, for her important question. As I've said in this place before, the only thing green about the Green Energy Act was the green that lined the pockets yeah. of Liberal insiders, yeah. as these projects cost ratepayers, folks who pay their bills every month for energy uh, in Ontario. But in keeping with quotable quotes, let's take a look at a few here. Laurie uh, Goldstein from the Toronto Sun said that, quote, the Liberals called their Green Energy Act fair. It was certainly fair to, wind, uh, to win power developers who received absurdly generous government subsidies to produce wind power. Yep. Rex Murphy, Mr. Uh. Speaker, quote, Ontario's Green Energy Act was a horror for business, a gross invasion of municipal authority, and sent successive auditor generals uh, to whatever is the chartered accountant's version Opposition come to order. of a hospice centre. Mr. Speaker, our government was elected to raise Ontario up from the energy policy sinkhole we found ourselves in. We cancelled those Response. 758 renew renewable energy contracts, and now we're going to march forward, repeal this act, and lower hydro rates for the people. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Minister of Energy. The expensive wind and solar projects our province did not need added a significant cost and burden to our province, and that's money that is coming out of the pockets of people right across Ontario. A 2015 Auditor General report found that ratepayers paid $37 billion more than the market price for electricity between 2006 and 2014 and would overpay another $133 billion by 2032. Over the years, the Liberals spent billions of taxpayer dollars to fund projects that simply weren't needed. These purchases were fueled by an ideology that favoured expensive, unreliable forms of renewable energy supplied by Liberal insiders. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to energy, Question. could the minister confirm that the culture of waste at Queen's Park is over? Here, here. Minister. 
these questions get me worked up, Mr. Speaker. Listen to Kevin Libin from the National Post. He said it best. The only businesses that need to worry are the government cronies whose sweetheart deals have long ripped off taxpayers. Mr. Speaker, these were projects that municipalities will now have the power to ensure they don't become home to wasteful energy projects our system doesn't need and many communities don't want. We believe, Mr. Speaker, that the people of Ontario should have the final say about what gets built in their community, that municipalities should have the power to stop expensive and unneeded energy projects in their community. So moving forward, Mr. Speaker, we will have a process that listens to the voices of municipalities. We will have lower costs that help get Ontario open for business, less expensive bills for families and businesses who pay an energy bill at the end of the month. Spons. Mr. Speaker, it's a great, great day today. It's We're going to be repealing day. the Green Energy Act. It's a victory for the people of Ontario, and it's worth something. Order. <laughs> Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> Speaker, my question to the Minister of the Environment. Not too long ago, we had a program in Ontario that helped homeowners to reduce their carbon footprint and save money. The program also created jobs for renovators and manufacturers of energy efficient windows and doors. Why did the Premier kill a program that helped ordinary families and small businesses and replace it with a climate change plan that forces people to give millions of dollars out of their own pockets to large polluters? The Minister of Environment, Climate Change, sorry, Mr. Minister Speaker, of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for his question. Mr. Speaker, uh, on, one, on one sense, the member is correct. We did cancel the wasteful programs of the previous government, which the NDP supported. Um, we cancelled programs that, frankly, got in the way of consumers making their own decisions and cost hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to subsidize businesses to let the government pick winners, not the market pick winners. We cancelled those programs, Mr. Speaker, and in their place, we put a sensible program, a program that makes sure that Ontario meets the international obligations that the federal government has set to hit the Paris targets and, in a very sensible, understandable, common-sense way, delivers on greenhouse gas reductions and, Mr. Speaker, supports home owners in the ways they want to be supported, preparing for climate change. Yeah. Surely the member opposite would support the fact sure. that we are going to be helping consumers Response. to do things like deal with their flooded basements. Those are the things that homeowners care about, and surely the member opposite will support that part of our program. Sure. Supplementary. Well, extraordinary answer. Uh, speaker again to the minister. When the Premier killed the Green Ontario Fund, Ontario families lost out on programs to help them conserve energy, reduce their carbon footprint, and save money. He got rid of programs that helped them save money. Window installers were forced to cancel hundreds of jobs and lay off workers. Some of them had to pay huge penalties to cancel custom window installations that were already underway. The Premier killed a program that helped families and businesses and replaced it with a plan that forces those same families and businesses to give millions of dollars out of their own pockets to large polluters. Why does the Premier think it's fair to hurt thousands of families and small businesses while giving millions of tax dollars to polluters? Minister. Mr. Speaker, as, uh, as the member likely knows but won't admit, the program that we cancelled that the, Ontarian, the Ontario uh, families in Ontario had had enough of was the cap-and-trade carbon tax. It was, a, it was a cost, a tax on families. It was a program and a cost that was taking money out of pockets, not putting money back into pockets, not making decisions for families about whether they needed a certain kind of window, but letting them Hamilton, make those choices. Hamilton, East, Mr. Speaker, Creek, that's the kind of program that this government will not support. A tax on families, a tax on businesses, a tax on jobs. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite has asked for our plan. 
plan and asked for our targets. We delivered our plan and our products. I asked earlier in the week, where is his plan? Where are their targets? What targets do they want to impose on Ontarians? We've picked the targets from Paris. We've picked the targets the federal government. Where are those, their plan? Where are their targets? Next question. The member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines and Indigenous Affairs. Speaker, the Northern Highways program is a crucial part of infrastructure investment all across Northern Ontario. It focuses on the rehabilitation and the expansion of the provincial highway system in the north. A number of major projects have been undertaken over the last 10 years, including the four laning of Highway 1117 between Thunder Bay and Ipigon and the four laning of Highway 69 between Perry Sound and Sudbury. And I'm also very conscious that another priority project is the four laning between Kenora and the Manitoba border, which I understand will get underway next year. So my question to the minister is this. Will you continue to support all three of those projects when the allocation of funds are made to the Northern Highways program? Minister of Energy, Northern Development, Mines and Thank you, Mr. Affairs. Speaker. And I've traveled many of those roads uh, over the years, and I understand their importance. I want to thank the member for this question. He had me up until Northern Roads. Uh, these are important investments, and I've had an opportunity quite recently to serve notice to the Indigenous communities across this vast region about our commitments to those roads. But the discussion around twinning of the highway, Mr. Speaker, is a sore spot for me. There are twinning uh, projects going on across the north, except for one place. An announcement that was made by Premier McGuinty in 2008 with our then Prime Minister that I served, Prime Minister Harper. And eight years later, Mr. Speaker, sorry, 10 years, nothing got done. Now, we know that the province of Ontario is responsible for developing those highways. Nothing happened out there, Mr. Speaker. We're hopeful that something will happen. We're working with our communities Response. to ensure that that section of the highway gets twinned, Mr. Speaker, and starts as quickly as possible. Thank you. Supplementary. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the Minister for the response. May I say that the significant consultations that took place uh, leading up to the work that is moving forward on the Kenora to Manitoba four landing, it was crucial, and I know I'm pleased to hear that indeed you are working with the communities to move that project forward. That doesn't make it any less important for us to sort of look at the other major projects all across northern Ontario the four landing between Thunder Bay and Nipigon, the four landing between Perry Sound and Sudbury. And I know also, Mr. Speaker, that uh, Minister Rickford was uh, a great supporter as a federal cabinet minister, uh, making an announcement related to some funding assistance for the, uh, uh, the, the section between Thunder Bay and Nipigon. And my question to the minister is, does he believe that the federal government has a major role to play in making sure the funding is there so that all these projects can be completed? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, at one time there was a $50 million commitment from the federal government with the provincial government at that time. There's a question out there, Mr. Speaker. It was designated to one of the most dangerous sections of the highway across northern Ontario, right at the Manitoba border. Where did the money go? $100 million was committed between the federal and provincial government at that time. There's no money left, Mr. Speaker. We understand and respect. I know my colleagues across the way in, uh, from Northern Ontario understand and respect that twinning of the highway, making our road network uh, safe, uh, Mr. Speaker, is a top priority. We'll be working with our communities in short order to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that we make the right investments Spons. in the right sections of highways that are consequential to the flow of Canadians across this great country and, tragically, Mr. Speaker, to the loss of lives in this province. Thank you. Next question, the member for Brantford, Grant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Health Canada, as part of its healthy eating strategy, has proposed revisions to Canada's food guide and is proposing mandatory front-of-package labelling for foods high in sugars, sodium and saturated fat. And while our government fully supports improving pu public health outcomes, it seems that the federal proposal would include things like dairy products. 
At a time when some of those in the agri-food industry are being hit hard by the new USMCA deal, the federal government, without adequate consultation with the sector, is implementing changes that include numerous consequences, like burdensome costs associated with the implementation of new labelling requirements. Can the minister please provide more details on these burdensome changes? Good question. Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and to the member from Brantford Brant for the question and his leadership on this important issue. Our government and Ontario food presses are supportive. Yeah, give him an applause. Our government and the Ontario food presses are supportive of efforts to help Canadians make healthy food choices. However, the proposed front of pack labeling requirements will be costly with little proven benefits to the health outcomes in some areas. An example of unintended consequences is the change in that some foods that may have more nutritional value, such as some cheeses and ground beef, now may require a front of package label for high co fat content, while other foods that might have less nutritional value, for instance, a diet soda, would not require a front of package label. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, we support our farmers and we're concerned with the proposal to put warning labels Response. on products that are 100% juice. Uh, Real juice. Our government is committed to lowering business costs and removing unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his answer. Dairy farmers in my riding are particularly concerned with these proposed changes as they are facing real challenges in their industry already with the new USMCA. A deal and now with new labeling requirements and new recommendations for protein intake. Any new food guide should continue to acknowledge that milk and dairy products are important in promoting healthy eating for Canadians. Dairy farmers are already facing many pressures and the proposed revision to Canada's food guide may exacerbate the situation. Can the minister please tell us what this government is doing to oppose these burdensome changes and support our farmers? Minister. Thank you much, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for the supplementary question. With the new U.S. MCA, dairy farmers are already facing many pressures. The dairy farmers of Ontario are concerned that the proposed changes could send a mixed message to Canadians about the value of consuming a variety of proteins. The proposed changes to the front of package labeling for cheeses or other milk products, such as yogurts, may also negatively impact our dairy farmers and producers with new burdensome costs and regulations. That's why both myself and the Minister of Economic Development, Development, Job Creation and Trade have written a letter to the Federal Ma Minister of Health asking the federal government to re-examine the implementations of these amendments to ensure consumers have appropriate and balanced information in a manner that does not con contradict science, add undue cost to businesses, and negatively impact competitiveness. Response. Our government looks forward to working with the agri-food sector and the federal government on this matter. Thank you very much for the Great. question. Thank you. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, yesterday the government announced the sale of 243 government properties at a shockingly low price of between $105 and $135 million. This is a rock bottom fire sale price, Speaker. What regulations will the government Messiah, put order. in place to ensure that the funds from publicly owned lands sold for rock bottom prices to developers will be used for affordable housing? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks very much, uh, Speaker, and through you to the honourable member. I was proud, Speaker, quite frankly, to. Uh, be asked by the Minister of Con Government Consumer Services to be at his announcement uh, yesterday. I made it uh, very clear uh, my message to not-for-profit uh, housing providers, to municipalities, to stakeholders interested in using some of these properties for affordable housing, that our, our, our door was open. We, we look uh, forward to working yeah. collaboratively with anyone that uh, sees an opportunity to use one of these properties for an affordable housing use. And I, and I have to say to the Honourable Member, uh, the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care was also mentioned because we believe on this side of the House that issues around affordable housing and future long-term care beds are extremely important. So if there is an organization, group, municipality that wants to sit down with us and create that opportunity, 
We're going to be there for them. Yeah. Supplementary. Speaker, again to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Our province is in the midst of an affordable housing crisis. And this government has decided to ignore evidence and deregulate rent for new units and new buildings in Ontario. Will the minister inform the House why, as more and more people are struggling to pay their rent, this government has taken rent control off the table? Minister. Well, again, Speaker, we'll, we'll jump from uh, our announcement yesterday to the fall economic statement. Uh, in the fall economic statement, our government for the people made a decision uh, on that rent control exemption. We wanted to send a, a very direct message that we want to create more housing. I've said, quite frankly, uh, in response to members from the opposite uh, side, uh, for sorry, for the, I don't want to disparage our members on the other awesome side. They're so awesome over I there. Say the, to the members of the official opposition, uh, supply is a very big problem. We have a crisis situation in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area, and we want to signal to our stakeholders that uh, we want to work with them. Again, I want to challenge this member, and I want to challenge all the New Democrat caucus to go onto our website, ontario.ca forward slash uh, housing supply. I want Response. you to have a round table. I want you to give us some suggestions on how to increase housing supply. We want you to be part of the solution. You keep indicating you're going to continue to be Next question. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for King Vaughan. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, Conservatives understand full well that manufacturing is vital to Ontario's economy and to our future prosperity. According to the Canadian manufacturers and exporters, this industry employs more than 770,000 Ontarians in high-paying jobs and indirectly supports another 1.5 million. Speaker, this sector has been hit hard by the former Liberal government. In 2017, Ontario had the dubious record of being the only province to see manufactured exports fall. Manufacturing sales growth was three times slower than the national average. Speaker, this Premier is totally resolved to create a competitive advantage and to fight to keep these jobs here in Ontario. We, we are resolved, Mr. Speaker, to fight against Justin Trudeau's job-killing carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister update this chamber on how our government will stand with our workers and stand up for the future of Ontario's manufacturing sector? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation. Speaker, that's a great question from the member from uh, King Vaughan, and it's great to have his parents here for the question today, too. Clearly, he comes from good stock. Speaker, this fall, we've taken remarkable strides to make Ontario open for business after 15 years of increased taxes, increased costs, increased red tape in Ontario. Bill 47, which we passed earlier this month, is going to make it easier to get more Ontarians into the trades. Yeah, yeah. That's how we're going to deal with closing the skills gap, Speaker, by improving the rate of capital cost depreciation, which the Finance Minister announced in the fall economic statement a couple of weeks ago, prompting the federal government, I might add, to follow Ontario's lead. We're making it easier for businesses to invest in new technologies yeah, yeah. and stay yeah, competitive. Yeah. But, Speaker, by no means is our job complete here Response. in Ontario. You don't roll back 15 years of damaging, job-killing Liberal policies in six months. We've got more to do, and we'll have more to say yeah, in the yeah. supplementary. Yeah, yeah. supplementary. Supplementary. Thank you, Spe thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for not giving up on this sector and for never giving in on the workers of this province. Speaker, under Liberals, Ontario fell behind. Ontario slipped to 14th place in global manufacturing outputs, down from 9th just 20 years ago. Yesterday, I was privileged to join the Parliamentary Secretary and the member from Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. We met with manufacturing leaders from the CME. Our message to these job creators was clear. This government will cut your taxes and your hydro rates. We will reduce your regulations and 
red tape. We will invest in a skilled labour market. We will open new markets for our job creators, and we will never turn our backs on traditional and advanced manufacturing in this province. With the recent release of our fall economic statement, could the minister outline how we will support the rebirth of Ontario's manufacturing sector? Minister. Speaker, thanks again for the question from the member for King Vaughan. I want the House to know that I take the federal minister's challenge from the fall economic statement seriously. We have to reduce red tape by 25 percent, and we're committed to reducing red tape by 25 percent by 2022. Now, I know members opposite have said there isn't 25 percent of red tape or over-regulation that you can cut in Ontario, but we have heard from industry that you certainly can. Speaker, Ontario has over 380,000 regulations. A lot of duplication. British Columbia only has 169,000, and British Columbia seems like a pretty nice place to live, Speaker, and a nice place to invest. If you can get by with 55 percent fewer regulations than Ontario, I know that we can cut 25 percent of our regulations here in Ontario. Now, I know the, the, member, the, the members opposite, the members of the NDP, Bonds. the members of the Liberal government, they like bigger government, but we believe in getting government out of the way so we can create new growth, new jobs, new industry here in Ontario. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, Speaker, for years now, Health Science North, Sudbury's regional hospital, has been massively underfunded. Funding cuts by previous Liberal and Conservative governments have forced the hospital to claw back health care services available to the good people of the North. Most recently, people in my community rallied together to protect the hospital's breast cancer screening clinic. Anne Matt, who helped establish the clinic two decades ago, uh, Sharon Murdoch, and dozens of other women held protests and meetings. They distributed pe uh, petitions and demanded that the lives of patients not be put online for cost savings. Will the minister listen to the people of Sudbury and fund our hospital properly? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I thank the member very much for the question, and in fact, I'm sure, as you are aware, Health Sciences North is facing financial problems, including an $11 million deficit in 2017-18. They have been working very hard with the LINs, however, to deal with some of those financial concerns, and we are committed to working with them and with the LIN to making sure that they can, can come back to financial health. But with respect to the uh, breast screening assessment service, I think it's important to mention that it is not closing. The LIN has been working closely with Health Sciences North to help the hospital ensure that mammograms, diagnostic imaging services, biopsies, and navigation will all be continuing uninterrupted as they are working through their financial difficulties. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her answer. I'm well aware of the uh, of the budget. The budget is there because of years and years of conservative and liberal cuts. They need the money to make ends meet, which is why they're cutting the breast cancer program. I want to tell you about Melissa. She was diagnosed with breast cancer when she was only 32 years old, and that dedicated team of the breast cancer screening clinic responded quickly to the, her aggressive cancer. Later, when she developed a rare infection, the clinic helped her navigate the system and ensured she received the best care. Melissa is now cancer-free, but she's worried how those recent cuts to the clinic will impact patients. She's worried that other patients will have to wait longer to see a surgeon or go through unnecessary stress while waiting to hear a diagnosis. The cost-cutting measures Health Science North has adopted to address the long-term underfunding threaten the services that provide excellent patient care for the women in the North. Will the minister invest in our hospital and protect this life-saving program? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, I would like to just correct the, uh, the, some of the facts that have been yeah. stated by the member on the other side in the official opposition. The breast screening program is not closing. 
It is continuing uninterrupted because there has been careful work that is being done between Health Sciences North, the Opposition Lynn and the Ministry. Yeah. We recognize that these services need to continue as they work through their financial difficulties. But that does not mean restricting patient Member care. For Ottawa Center, what we want to do and what we were elected to do is bring yeah. more money into frontline yeah. care. After 15 years of the former Liberal government not developing a comprehensive Supported plan, we are going to develop that plan. We are going to make sure that hospitals have the services they need, and we are going to make sure those essential patient services, such as Spons. the screening assessment program, continues. Thank you. Next question, the member for Mississauga Malton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yay. Mr. Speaker, my question is also for the Minister of Energy, North, Energy, Northern Development and Mines. By the way, Will, I miss you here. <laughs> <laughs> I know the Honourable Minister has been working tirelessly since day one. From the beginning, our government for the people is committed to make energy more affordable in this province. And we know that Ontario families have been hurt by the bad energy policy decision of the previous government. This is why our government is working hard to provide relief to families and businesses across our province. Mr. Speaker, I know the minister spoke, to, spoke at the Toronto Region Board of Trade last week. Can the minister please tell the member of this house about his remarks last week and how this government is restoring affordability for job creators in this house, in this province. The Minister for Energy, Northern Development and Mines and Indigenous Affairs. What a great question, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Mississauga Malton for that question and for the great work he does for his constituents. Yeah. An outstanding colleague. And I also want to thank the Toronto Region Board of Trade for having me speak at their power breakfast. It was themed Restoring Ontario's Energy Advantage. We discussed and reflected on a province that led this country. Uh, at one point, Mr. Speaker. Manufacturing jobs were here. Miners and foresters were hard at work in Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker. But slowly, surely, then almost declivitously, it went away. Why, Mr. Speaker? Because we didn't have that energy advantage. Because the NDP and the Liberals got together, Mr. Speaker, and made it a whole lot less affordable for those manufacturers, for those mining operations, and for those foresters to do their work and contribute to Response. our economy, Mr. Speaker. We, there was a time when Ontario led, Mr. Speaker. We're looking for that Ontario's energy advantage, and we're going to get there, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. I'd like to thank Minister for taking action that's helping my constituents of Mississauga Malton, and not only them, but everyone in Ontario, keeping money, more money in their pockets. Mr. Speaker, our government has been working hard to make sure that we create an environment that encourages business to grow and create good-paying jobs. I know that restoring Ontario's energy advantage is a crucial part of protecting jobs and growth in this province. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell the members of this House more about how our government has been taking action to protect and create good-paying jobs in Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Mr. Speaker, what we're doing is protecting that skilled workforce, particularly in the nuclear sector, Mr. Speaker, that contributes so significantly to Ontario's electric supply, 60 per cent coming from our nuclear assets. Now, we've been talking about process today, Mr. Speaker. Let's just walk through a process that may have occurred on June 7th. Had the NDP been elected, Mr. Speaker, 7,500 high-paid workers in the nuclear sector Position cut loose, Mr. Order. Speaker. Imagine the chaos that would have ensued with Center, massive Governor. unemployment in the Durham region, particularly in Pickering, Mr. Speaker, and how many homes and businesses Waterloo, would Order. be without uh, electricity, Mr. Speaker? That's why we wasted no Member time Ottawa Center, repealing, Governor working Order. towards repealing the Green Energy Act, canceling wasteful Spons. contracts that communities didn't want and the grid didn't meet. The NDP deals in chaos. We deliver in confidence, the NDP. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Agoma, Manitoba. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. 
The Service Ontario office located in the town of Wawa, in my writing, is only open four hours per day, four days per week. During those short operating hours, residents must often wait for long hours for basic services. These inadequate operating hours not only hurt individual residents, but also hurt small business that directly rely on the Service Ontario office. A, lo a local power sport equipment de uh, dealership in Wawa must wait until customers register for a license before finalizing a transaction. Scheduling purchase pickups around Service Ontario hours forces customers to travel twice or reconsider their whole purchase. This is a damaging uh, to our local economy and to our small businesses. Can the minister explain to Wawa small businesses owners why they don't deserve better service than that? Mr. Government, consumer service. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you to my colleague, and thank you for the question. We do a lot of good work being on either side of the uh, Shishiman. Uh, it's always uh, our, our best intent that we want to have those services out there for the community when they want them. Service Ontario is a very valued contributor to all of our communities across Ontario. Certainly, there are some challenges there, but we're working through that. As you're well aware, I've only been in the role for about three weeks, but I've had a briefing already. I've met with some of the service providers directly, and we are looking to do that. We want to ensure that we restore accountability and trust across government here, here. for the people of Ontario. We want to make life more affordable. We want to make consistent and good services, and I'm happy to work with you to see what we can do to do that. Thank you. Good Supplementary. Well, Speaker, my friend, it's time that we jump into that big canoe and let's row in the same direction together. In addition to inadequate service Ontario operating hours, community members from Wawa and Shaplo are forced to wait months to book their drive tests. Then, after waiting for months, they arrive for their appointments but are told that there are no qualified staff members available to conduct exam or special DZ licenses. These licenses are necessary to drive vehicles such as dump trucks, cement trucks, garbage trucks, rescue and fire trucks, and guess what else? Snow plows. <laughs> this is creating a barrier to employment and causing unnecessary hardship for small businesses by ne neglecting secondary industries that require specialized drive trainers. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier, can the Minister, please Question. tell residents why they can expect to see fair services delivery in northern communities? Minister. Thank you very much for that kind promotion, my friend. This is an excellent, this is an excellent way to, uh, and, and an excellent reason why we need to modernize our public services in a way that puts reliability and taxpayers at the center of everything we do, and puts structures in place that create a culture of efficiency. We're doing a line-by-line -line review. We're going to modernize services and better utilize digital and shared service models so we provide better services for all Ontarians through finding more cost-efficient ways of administering government by ensuring government funding is directed to those that require it most, and finally by maximizing the value of government assets and putting them to their most productive use. Mr. Speaker, to my colleague across the road, we are, are, we are committed, and I want to applaud all of the people at Service Ontario and the people in my ministry that are doing their best to modernize and ensure that we have as many services in a timely and effective manner as possible. We want to keep people working. Response. We're going to work our best to make sure we have those services available, and we want to make sure that Ontario is a better place because of the public service. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. In Ontario, we have more than 70 organizations involved in special needs hockey. Athletes have a range of different exceptionalities from Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, and autism, just to name a few. We know there's more than just a health benefit from participating in sports. Through sport, we build a camaraderie, a sense of being, and a purpose from working together that has a greater impact than something that any of us does as an individual. Can the minister explain how our government, for the people, is working to promote and support great initiatives that Special Hockey International are working on? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and through you, I'd like to thank the member for Peterborough Kawartha for this important question and also for the great work that he does advocating on behalf of people with special needs. Through my ministry, 
Through my ministry, Mr. Speaker, our government provides support for many sport initiatives, which include supports for sport, sports programs for those with special needs. In our fall economic statement, we committed to marking a new special hockey day in the province. As outlined, the government proposes to formally recognize March 27, 2019 as Special Hockey Day. This will coincide with the start of the 25th annual Special Hockey International Tournament that will be hosted right here in Toronto. Recognizing Response. Special Hockey Day will bring awareness about the many special hockey organizations across Ontario and celebrate the contributions of teams, players and organizers. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the minister for his response. As he said, March 27th is the opening ceremonies for the 25th anniversary of Special Hockey International Tournament. And it's the first time it's back in Ontario since my riding of Peterborough Kawartha hosted the tournament in 2016. We had the pleasure of having more than 1,000 athletes from 58 teams, some from as far away as Sela, Sweden, and it even included the Werewolves of London. The celebration is being held this year in Toronto at the Madame Athletic Centre, and it's being hosted by the Grand Ravine Tor Tornadoes. Can the minister update the legislature on how the Doug Ford-led government is working to champion those with special needs through sport? Great minister. Thank you uh, once again, Mr. Speaker, uh, for that uh, question from, uh, from the member from uh, Peterborough Kawartha. As I stated in my first response, our government is committed to helping communities host major amateur sporting events across Ontario. I'd also like to note that Special Olympics Ontario is a recognized provincial sport organization and receives funding through the Ontario Amateur Sport Fund. We also provide project-based funding to help deliver national and international amateur sport events in Ontario, like the 2019 International Special Olympics Youth Games held here in Ontario. Our government recognizes how powerful sport is in bringing us together. This tournament does exactly that, and I look forward for special hockey players Response. from around the world coming to Toronto and for us as Ontarians to celebrate the first ever special hockey here, here. day in Ontario. Member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Minister, a few weeks ago, when I asked about two-way all-day go to Waterloo Region, the response was, stay tuned. Well, we've tuned in, but what we're seeing isn't positive at all. Metrolink's new 200-page business case for go expansion takes two-way all-day go to Kitchener out of the main plan and pushes the completion date to as far away as 2030. What does the government have to say about following in the footsteps of the Liberals and, st and stringing the people of Waterloo Region along again. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you uh, for that uh, question, from member opposite. And uh, I said stay tuned. I don't think you've tuned into the right frequency yet. But <laughs> seriously, we're going to be making uh, an uh, uh, announcement forthcoming that I think you'll be happy with. We're uh, uh, finalizing details of, of what we've been doing for the entire province. We've been reviewing all the uh, plans and procedures that uh, have been put forth by the previous government. Uh, we're making sure that all our decisions are. Uh, for the people of this province, sure that we're opening up for business, and uh, I think uh, the people of this province, uh, especially uh, in the GTHA and particularly in Cambridge and Kitchener, uh, they're going to be pretty happy with how this government's going to proceed with transit projects across this this province. Uh, as uh, the premier has said, uh, we're opening this province up for business, and the best way to do that is to get people moving, and this province is going to get the people moving. Is not going to fly in Waterloo Region. We hear radio silence from this government on progressive transit plans. Our province, Mr. Speaker, our province will never be able to compete globally if Kitchener, Waterloo, and Toronto are separated by a 100-kilometer-long parking lot, and that's from the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. People in Waterloo Region are frustrated and for good reason. The Metrolinx report doesn't make them feel any better. This is what the report says for the, for the uh, listening pleasure of the minister. As part of GO expansion, the Kitchener line will see significant upgrades between Bramley and Union Station. Minister, what about the rest of the line? What about Brampton and Guelph and Georgetown? And what about Kitchener? We've waited too long. Minister. 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 
Thank you, uh, Speaker. And, and again, uh, through you to the member opposite, uh, you know, I've been working with uh, members in my caucus. They've come forward with uh, ideas on improving GO service between Kitchener and, and Toronto. And, uh, you know, I, I wish you'd come over and have that conversation with me and have that discussion instead of asking and yelling and screaming in the House. It's better to sit down at the table and have a discussion to ensure that we can make the best of this province. So I invite you to come over and have a discussion with Order. concludes our time for question period. Once again, I, I remind the government, as soon as the ovation started, I couldn't hear the minister. I had to cut him off. Point of, point of order to the member for Timmins. I'm not sure I heard correctly, but I heard uh, what I heard, I hope, wasn't a sexist comment towards my member. Order. It's not, it's not a point of order. The member for Windsor to come see on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. With your permission, I notice we have a, a guest in the gallery, a former member, a uh, former minister, Teresa Peruza from Windsor West. Welcome back. Please come. And I too wanted to welcome the former member uh, uh, representing uh, Windsor West in the 40th Parliament. Welcome back to Queen's Park. I beg to inform the House that the following document has been tabled, the 2018 Annual Report from the Office of the Auditor General of Ontario. We now have a deferred vote on a motion for closure. On the motion for third reading of Bill 32, call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.
Members, please take their seats. Would the members please take their seats? On November 22, 2018, Mr. Bethlen Falby moved third reading of Bill 32, an act to amend the Ontario Energy Board Act 1998. Mr. Romano has moved that the question now be put. All those in favour of Mr. Romano's motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Yur. Mr. Yur. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipies. Mr. Pettipies. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Kalanga. Mr. Kalanga. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Sakari. Mr. Sakari. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamar. Ms. Gamar. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carhalia. Mrs. Carhalia. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Court. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mr. Baum. Mr. Baum. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Babikia. Mr. Babikia. Mr. Baba. Mr. Baba. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Tanagas. Mr. Tanagas. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be counted by the Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Madam Jelena. Madam Jelena. Mr. Tabbis. Mr. Tabbis. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Bagot. Ms. Bagot. Mr. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Ms. West. Mr. West. Mr. West. Sorry. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Brampton Mr. East. Singh, Brampton East. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Ba Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Monsieur Bourguin. Monsieur Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rykosevich. Mr. Kosevich. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. The ayes are 67, the nays are 39. The ayes being 67, the nays being 39, I declare the motion carried. Mr. Bethlen Falvey has moved to third reading of Bill 32, an act to amend the Ontario Energy Board Act 1998. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? Aye. Some no's. All those in favour of the motion will please say aye. aye. All those opposed will please say nay. nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be a 10-minute bell. No. Same vote? No. no.
Mr. Bethlen Falvey has moved third reading of Bill 32, an act to amend the Ontario Energy Board Act 1998. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Walker, Ms. Thompson, Ms. Thompson, Mr. Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Mr. Ford, Mr. Ford, Ms. Elliott, Ms. Elliott, Mr. Yeah. Europe, Mr. Europe, Mr. Europe, Ms. Mulroney, Ms. Mulroney, Ms. McLeod, Ms. McLeod, Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, Mr. Hardiman, Mr. Hardiman, Mr. Tavolo, Mr. Tavolo, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. Pettipes, Mrs. Marteau, Mrs. Marteau, Mr. McDonnell, Mr. McDonnell, Ms. Fullerton, Ms. Fullerton, Ms. Scott, Ms. Scott, Ms. Jones, Ms. Jones, Mr. Cho Scarborough North, Mr. Cho Scarborough North, Mr. Rickford, Mr. Rickford, Mr. Phillips, Mr. Phillips, Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka, Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka, Mr. Lecce, Mr. Lecce, Mr. Coe, Mr. Coe, Mr. Downey, Mr. Downey, Mr. Mr. Gill, Mr. Cook, Mr. Cook, Mr. Kalanga, Mr. Kalanga, Ms. Serma, Ms. Serma, Mr. Parson, Mr. Parson, Ms. Skelly, Ms. Skelly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Ms. Triantafilopoulos, Ms. Triantafilopoulos, Mr. Sakaria, Mr. Sakaria, Mr. Osterhoff, Mr. Osterhoff, Ms. Park, Ms. Park, Mr. Hillier, Mr. Hillier, Mr. Nichols, Mr. Nichols, Ms. Kusindova, Ms. Kusindova, Mr. Romano, Mr. Romano, Mr. Harris, Mr. Harris, Ms. Gamari, Ms. Gamari, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Mrs. Carhollius, Mrs. Carhollius, Mrs. Fee, Mrs. Fee, Mr. Cho. Willadell. Mr. Cho Willadell. Mr. Smith Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith Peterborough Court. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mr. Baum. Mr. Baum. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Anon. Mr. Anon. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babbitt. Mr. Babbitt. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Tanagas. Mr. Tanagas. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. All those opposed to the motion will please rise. Mr. Tabbitt. Mr. Tabbitt. Madam Jones. Madam Jones. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Dadashaw. Mr. Dadashaw. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Stiles. Ms. Stiles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Andrews. Mr. Hatfield, Mr. Burns McGowan, Mr. Burns McGowan, Mr. Arthur, Mr. Arthur, Mr. Bourguin, Mr. Bourguin, Mr. Bell, Mr. Bell, Ms. Bell, Ms. Bell, Mr. Glover, Mr. Glover, Ms. Morrison, Ms. Morrison, Mr. Rikosovich, Mr. Rikosovich, Mr. Harden, Mr. Harden, Ms. Monty Farrell, Ms. Monty Farrell, Mr. Hassan, Mr. Hassan, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Hunter, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Shrine, Mr. Shrine. The ayes are 68, the nays are 38. The ayes being 68 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.